Welcome to worship service today. Uh, are there any announcements? Okay, so for the parcels behind me as well as the parsonage. Okay, so the final land survey for the parsonage and the parcels behind that we're looking at selling. Um, if you want to see that, um, contact Terry. Uh, other announcements. A reminder that we do have a congregational meeting next week and we do need a quorum at that congregational meeting. Um, where we are going to be voting on the repair of the bell tower area and going over the land sale and voting on the land sale. The parsonage is already voted on, but the two lots behind it, um, the land sale on those. So uh, hopefully some of you watching us online today will see that as well, see that announcement. Um, and remember that we need everyone in church next week to make those decisions. Anything else? Um, I can have it set up on Zoom, um, but they can't be on Facebook. So if you're online, you cannot be on Facebook. You have to be on Zoom if you want to vote. Oh, that's right. We don't have it on Facebook. Well, I put the recording on Facebook, though. So, um, yeah, but if you want to vote live, you have to be on the Zoom link. Any other announcements? Birthdays and anniversaries. I don't know anybody who has birthday this week. Oh, Reno, Reno, do you have the same birthday I have? Oh, you're a little behind. All right, so happy birthday, Reno. My birthday was Friday. Happy birthday, me. I don't think there's anybody here who wants to sing happy birthday a cappella, so we'll just swing right on past that today. <laughs> I invite you to rise as you are able for our call to worship. How very good and pleasant it is when the beloved community live together in unity. It is like the precious oil on our heads which anoints our worship and praise. It is like a soft mist which falls on the mountains of the earth. For there God has ordained the blessing, life, forevermore. You may be seated as we pray together. Dear precious God, be with us in this day in our worship and praise. Strengthen our faith in the teachings of Christ and may the Holy Spirit be our guide as we pray. Help us to be the disciples of Christ in the world today. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Our opening hymn is We Gather Together. And since I forgot to ch plug this into charge last week, I'm going to have to keep switching it back and forth between the speakers and the charger. <laughs>
the peace of the Lord be with you all. Let us take a moment and share God's peace with one another and everybody joining us online or watching the recording later this week. We pray that God's peace is with you as well. At this time, we're going to collect up our prayers for later on in the worship service. Uh, I know we're praying for the victims of the storms uh, down in southern Wisconsin. Uh, last night, are there other prayer concerns to raise up? I'm going to put Julie on the list as well. I know she's still home recovering from her uh, surgery. All right. Pray for those folks. If you're joining us online and have prayer concerns, uh, you can... Jimmy? Yep. Uh, you can type those into the chat or the comments, and if we get them in time today, we will uh, include them. If we get them later in the week, I'll check it at the end of the week. I'll pray for those folks. I know Jane is with us online, and she's been praying for Eli, so I'm going to put him on the list because I'm going to assume that uh, she still wants us praying for him. Let us pray now for ourselves. As we gather in worship, let us take this moment to consider our need for transformation and forgiveness. Dear God, the creator of all things based on love, you created us in your image of love, and there have been times we have fallen short of that love, not only to you, but to each other and all of creation. We thank you for the comforting strength and compassion of the Holy Spirit to do better in bringing love and grace in all we do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We take a moment of silence now for silent confession, reflection, and uh, prayer. As Paul reminds us in 2 Corinthians, at an acceptable time, God has listened to us, and on a day of salvation, God has helped us. Friends, we are forgiven through Christ. We trust that God is with us in all hardships, and we commit ourselves to be people who care for others who need to experience God's love. Amen. Our first scripture, <coughs> excuse me, our first scripture reading for today comes from the writing of the book of Job, and all of our scriptures today focus on why bad things or chaos happen to good people. And so the story of Job, I'll kind of back us up and tell you the whole story because we're going to start at the end of the book. The story of Job essentially is that Job is listed as a good and righteous man, we're told. And uh, lots of bad things happen to him, all sorts of bad things. He gets sick, his family gets sick, his wife dies, his kids die, his animals die, he loses all his wealth, uh, and eventually he is homeless and destitute and ill and has absolutely nothing left. And once he reaches that point, his friends gather around, and you would think his friends would gather around to comfort and strengthen him, but they don't. His friends gather around to blame him. So he uh, is absolutely in the worst of the worst places you could possibly be, and his friends gather around and they tell him, well, you must have done something wrong. That's why God is making these bad things happen to you, because you're a bad person. He's like, nope haven't done anything wrong. And then his next friend gather, or shows up and he says, well, maybe you didn't do anything wrong, but maybe your uh, 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 ancestors did something wrong and that's why all this bad stuff is happening to you. And Job's like, nope, that's not the reason. So finally, Job goes and talks to God directly and says, essentially, he raises a complaint. God, 
why is all this terrible stuff happening to me? I'm a good person, I'm righteous, I haven't done anything wrong. Why is all this bad stuff happening to me? And so essentially the question is, why does bad stuff happen to good people? And God's answer, to me it sounds like God is the parent of a toddler. So as the parent of a toddler, Toddlers are famous for asking the question, why? Why is the water blue? Well, because it reflects the, the sky. Why is the sky blue? Well, because there's this thing called light shift and it's this scientific thing. Well, why is that like that? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And the game can go on for hours, right? You've played this game with your kids. Why, 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 why? And eventually you get to the point of saying, because I said so, because you're sick of answering the question. And sometimes you say, because I'm older than you and I'm bigger than you and that's just the way it is. And that's essentially the answer that God gives to Job. God essentially says to Job, you weren't there when I created the world. You don't control the wind and the waves. You aren't the one who puts all of these things in place. And therefore, you don't get to decide what happens in this world. Now, one might suggest that Job is asking the wrong question. Rather than asking why do bad things happen to good people, in his case, why does something bad happen specifically to him who is good, perhaps the question is not why does the, the chaos of this world happen, perhaps a better question is who is it that sustains us and cares for us in the midst of that chaos. And as we move into our other readings today, we're going to hear more about that. But the first one here from Job, chapter 38, we're going to read verses 1 through 11. Here's God's answer to Job's question, why is all this bad stuff happening to me when I'm a good person? Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind. Who is it that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Gird up your loins like a man, and I will question you, and you shall declare to me. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? On what were its bases sunk? Or who laid the cornerstones when the morning stars sang together and all the heavenly beings shouted for joy? Or who shut in the sea when it's with doors when it burst from the womb? When I made clouds its, dark, clouds its garment and thick darkness its swaddling band, and prescribed bounds for it, and set bars and doors, and said, thus far you shall come, and no further, and here your proud waves shall be stopped. It's the word of the Lord, and it continues on like that for several pages of God saying, essentially, you weren't there, you didn't create it, you don't even have enough knowledge to know the answer to your own question. Our second reading then comes from 2 Corinthians. We're reading uh, consecutively through this book, so by the end of summer you'll be able to say, oh, I read a whole book of the Bible, um, assuming you're listening to church or at church every day. So we're on 2 Corinthians chapter 6, and in this chapter we're dealing with similar sorts of things. Only in this case, uh, Paul is telling the church at Corinth that no matter what happens in his life, good, bad, or otherwise, that he is continually faithful and dedicated to God and that God cares for him in the midst of all of it. So 2 Corinthians chapter 6, starting at the first verse. Paul writes, as we work together with Christ, we urge you also not to accept the grace of God in vain. 
For he says, at an acceptable time I have listened to you, and on a day of salvation I have helped you. See, now is the acceptable time. Now is the day of salvation. We are putting no obstacle in anyone's way so that no fault may be found with our ministry. But as servants of God, we have commended ourselves in every way. Through great endurance, in afflictions, hardships, calamities, beatings, imprisonments, riots, labors, sleepless nights, hunger, by purity, knowledge, patience, kindness, holiness of spirit, genuine love, truthful speech, and the power of God. With the weapons of righteousness for the right hand and the left, in honor and, is and dishonor, in ill repute and good repute, we are treated as impostors and yet are true, as unknown and yet are well known. As dying, and see, we are alive. As punished, and yet not killed. As sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. As poor, yet making many rich. As having nothing, and yet possessing everything. We have spoken to you frankly, Corinthians. Our heart is wide open to you. There is no restriction in our affections, but only in yours. In return, I speak as to children. Open wide your hearts also. The word of the Lord. Our next hymn is number 418. My faith, it is an oaken staff.
Our gospel lesson for today comes from St. Mark, the fourth chapter, starting at, I believe, the 35th verse today. And we're reading the section, uh, one of the sections of Mark where Jesus stills the storm. So as we read this, there's a couple things to pay attention to. One, that as uh, the story goes, the boat is already being swamped, meaning it's already sinking before Jesus wakes up in the, in the stern. So Jesus is clearly not nearly as concerned because he already knows the outcome um, as the people who are in the boat. Mark chapter 4, starting at the 35th verse. On that day, when evening had come, Jesus said to the disciples, Let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd behind, they took, with, they took him with them in the boat, just as he was. Other boats were with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat, so that the boat was already being swamped. But Jesus was in the stern, asleep on a cushion. And they woke him up and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? He woke up and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. Then the wind ceased, and there was a dead calm. He said to them, Why are you afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great awe, and said to one another, Who then is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him? The Gospel of the Lord. There are many things in this world that we can control. Probably many, well, certainly many more things in this world that we can control right now than there were even for the people who originally had this experience in Jesus Christ's time. We can control all sorts of things. If we want our house warmer, we just push a button on the wall and the heat turns on and our house warms up. If we want our house colder, we push a different button on the wall and the air conditioning turns on and our house cools down. We can control uh, how quickly and easily we travel in this world. Once upon a time, traveling across the United States would have been a difficult and arduous process. Now, if I want to travel from coast to coast, I get on my computer, I push a few buttons, I buy a plane ticket, and I go in the course of just a few hours from one end of the country to the other. We can control a lot of things, and because we can control so many things, we begin to have the illusion that, in fact, we are in control. And when we have the illusion that we are in control, we think that our life and how good or bad it is, is in fact because of how good or bad, usually we think of ourselves as good, so how good we are. And therefore we can fall into the trap that Job's friends fell into of blaming those who are not having things go their way, blaming them for their own troubles. Well, if you were more in control of your own life, you wouldn't be in this situation. Things wouldn't be going so badly for you. And to some extent, that's true. To some extent, there are some choices we make that make our lives better or worse. But the idea that we are entirely in control of everything is an absolute fallacy. Now, I was, when I wrote this sermon earlier this week, going to talk about all of the rain we've had. 
because the one thing we cannot control is the weather. I don't even have to look back to this past week now because last night, if you ask any of the people in southern Wisconsin who were affected by the tornadoes and the flooding and the straight line winds that have destroyed uh, so much down there, you certainly are not going to find people who thought they had control over any of that because we cannot control the weather. Now in Jesus' day, the men and women who lived in that day had control over some things, maybe not as quickly and easily as we do, but they still had control over some things, but the one thing they couldn't control is the same thing we can't control, and that was the weather. And so when they set out to sea, and it was calm and peaceful when they set out, they thought they were going to sail comfortably across the sea and get to the other side and be set and ready for the next day. But in fact, partway through, a storm blew up and we're told that the boat was sinking and they were terrified. Now they could have asked the question, why do bad things happen to good people? Why is our boat sinking? They could have complained to God and gotten the answer, well, you don't control all of the things that you think you control. Or they could have asked what is perhaps a more important question. While our boat is sinking, who is it that is with us that can grant us safety? Who is it that is with us that can control the wind and the waves and the chaos? And so that's the question they ask each other. What can we do about this? Oh, we can wake up Jesus who's sleeping in the stern of the boat. And in waking him up, we know that he can take care of something that we cannot. So there's this understanding the disciples have that Jesus Christ is bigger than they are, is in some way connected to God and therefore can control that which is uncontrollable, the wind and the waves that are swamping them. And I always find this story kind of funny because when Jesus wakes up, it is my sense that he doesn't calm the wind and the waves in order to stop the boat from being swamped. He knew the boat wasn't going to be swamped. He calms the wind and the waves because he's just annoyed that he had to get woke up. He calms the wind and the waves, and then he goes to his disciples and says, how do you not have faith? How did you not know I was going to bring you through this storm? Why is it that you bothered waking me up from my nap in order to calm the wind and the waves, why couldn't you trust in the midst of the storm that I was with you? So he says, oh you, have you still no faith? When we are going through the storms of life, the chaos that comes upon us, the things we cannot control. It might be the weather, it might be our health, it might be the actions of people around us, it might be the actions of our community, our society, our government, whatever. When we find that we cannot control what is going on around us, we can know who is in the boat with us. The disciples are scolded because they had no faith that being in the boat with Jesus meant that they were going to be okay no matter what chaos came their way. We are called to learn from the disciples' mistake. To understand that God is with us in the chaos. And no matter what comes, God has it under control. The Apostle Paul tells us that at an acceptable time and on a day of salvation, the Lord has helped us. The Apostle Paul also tells us that now is the acceptable time and now is the day of salvation. That Christ is now with us in the chaos and in 
the storm. The question is not the question that Job asked, why do storms happen to good people? The question rather is, who is in the storm with us to sustain us through it? And the answer is that Jesus Christ is in the boat. And because God is in the storm with us, no matter what comes, we can face the day. We can face the chaos. We can face the storm, the winds, and the waves. And God will strengthen us through it. God is not with us only, however. God is also with all of those others who are going through chaos in this time. And God is often with those others through God's people, God's hands and God's heart in the world. And so we are called to remember that God is with us in our chaos, and to bring God's presence and love and care and concern to those who are going through their own chaos. Not to be like Job's friends, blaming them, but rather to be in a position where we are helping in some way. Today, Christ says to the wind and the waves, peace, be still. Christ promises to be with us in our chaos, and Christ calls us to support others in their chaos in the name of the one who calms the storm. Amen. Our next hymn is number 441, Jesus, Savior, Pilot Me. Gracious God, you who provide 
calm seas and you who still the storms of life, be with us in our chaos. Sustain us through all that this life brings and help us to sustain others in your name. We pray this day, Lord, for those who need your healing touch. Especially we pray for Julie, Jimmy, and Eli, asking for blessing, comfort, peace, patience, and healing. And we pray for those who need your help to rebuild, those who were victims of the tornadoes and straight line winds and flooding in southern Wisconsin. Lord, bless them and help us to reach out in whatever ways we can so that we can help others in this world weather the storms. We pray all of this in the name of Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We are grateful for the gifts that we receive in our lives, and we invite all to participate in the opportunity of generosity to continue the mission of God's love in the world. We are grateful and thankful. Today our offering is taken with the plate at the back of the sanctuary. You can place your offerings in as you leave. If you're joining us online and would like to support the ministry of this congregation, you can do so by mailing offerings to P.O. Box 165, Dale, Wisconsin, 54931. Even as those offerings make their way here, we dedicate them back to God's work. O oh, Holy One, with gratefulness we offer and dedicate these gifts for the continuation of our work in Christ's name. Amen. Our closing hymn is number 438, When Peace Like a River.
please rise as you are able for our closing blessing. Dear friends, as we go out into the world and when a storm brews in life, remember to be in peace and be still, knowing that God's presence never leaves us. Be the light of peace to a world which seeks it in the name of the God who created, sustains, and redeems us. Amen.